and then um, okay, you should be seeing the doc. I shared the I shared a doc in the um, in the chat. Um, go ahead, everyone, and yourself, and Tendi. Okay, so we have a bunch of topics for today. Um, uh, we don't have to go in any particular order, but uh, I posted kind of on the mailing list um, a few hours ago, um, one of the topics that uh, I did want to talk about. Um, and particularly, um, it was interesting because it was something that, um, that we were looking at actually in, in NVIDIA the last few days, um, and something we're, we were dealing with. Um, and so we were, just to kind of give some background, so we were doing some load testing um, fairly recently um, around the 700, VM mark. Um, we were doing it actually between releases because uh, we were looking to upgrade. We were running 0.24 um, and uh, we were moving to 0.35. Um, and we were noticing um, the, some latency with um, API calls. This is uh, actually a, a partial snapshot of the, um, the Kubernetes um, API call latency. Um, and you can see that there's a huge difference between 0.35 and um, 0.24, 0.24 being there's there's no activity. And then 0.35, there's actually quite a bit of activity. Um, and to the point where when you hit 700 VMs, I think it's roughly about 200 nodes, um, the list API call latency explodes um, up to a minute. I think it even goes higher. Um, I think it's gonna go higher. I don't know, this in this graph, it, it just caps at a minute, but everything balloons, you can see even, um, uh, let me even zoom in more. You can see like how um, update balloons to four seconds. Normally the baseline is, you can see it down here and some of the other ones, it's it's um, it's in the milliseconds um, and it explodes, explodes quite a bit. And um, yeah, as opposed to, to two, four. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I, I thought I'd mention it because um, it was, uh, I, we don't, I don't, we don't know the cause. Um, what it was with zero through five that that caused this, um, but it was it was interesting to see um, to actually measure this and, and saw a, a major impact because I think you know one of the goals that we we, we set at least for, for this sig um, was to try and stay at like less than one second uh, latency for the API calls. That's generally what the the, the goal that Kubernetes has set. Um, so it was interesting to see this and, and from our, um, I can even provide more information. There's like, we, we see from events, the virtual machine instance events um, is exploding. I mean, it's like the number of events uh, is astronomical compared to other things. Um, there's very little, very few pods, very few other things. I mean, it's just tons and tons of list events coming from vert handlers um, that, that causes this. So. Um, I figured I'd mention it in case, I don't know, maybe people had some ideas or we could talk about some of the details. Um, I'd love to uh, talk yeah, about it. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we fixed the bug there with that. They were, Virgin Handler was listen, listing on such, an, on these releases and it should. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, so funny you mentioned that. So this is actually with that bug fix. We, I, we pulled this in because you, I, you, I saw you guys did this. And this is actually with this, um, the result with that bug fix. And, what and was this the bug fix, just for clarity? Um, yeah, let me find the... Um, Wait, I mean, uh, what's the high level? Like, Roman, do you remember what list we were, what object it was we were calling list on? I'm guessing storage. So the, 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 there was a bug in the Prometheus uh, metrics collector. Uh, it was uh, really listing all VMs periodically instead of going to a, through, oh my gosh. through the watcher. Yeah. I think even you did the uh, fix. Or was it uh, Marcus? Marcus could be too. Uh, you are Marcus, was it too? Okay. Uh, okay. Give me just a second. I'll find the, the bug. I, I I forget if it was. So what I remember, the thing we pulled in. OK, here it is. It's um, um, Qvert PR. So you said you pulled it in. Uh, were you able to rebuild and then deploy? Or how do we know that this bug fix made it into your test environment? Yeah, so we we, we did, um, we pulled it in, we did a build with it and, and, and deployed with it. Um, 
And are we certain that the um, the build manifests are referencing the newly built containers that you had, or I guess I'm trying to just make sure that there wasn't a scenario where we rebuilt and everything, but the manifests still reference like an old container version or something like that instead of the one that you all built. Yeah. Um, we went through the normal build process on this and, and yeah, I mean, the, like it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in there. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm pretty confident it's in there. Sure. Um, so Good. let me see, where's the, here it is. This one, is this the one you're talking about? This was the one that we kind of we backported. Uh, no, that one. Let me see. Uh, that one's not terrible. It's performing a list watch and all VMIs in the cluster and every vert handler, but it's going to just do that periodically. Like it's, it's part of the informer. That, that wasn't great. I don't think we're just going to see a thrashing of lists necessarily, unless there's a lot of errors in the informer and it's constantly him to resync. Okay. So which was the, so which was the one that you guys uh, saw this on? So you said it was Prometheus because that, that sounds. Sorry, I'm still checking it. Um, okay. If it, yeah, I no mean, problem. Uh, yeah. I, I think it is the one I talked about. It was in the, no way. Do you have the other metrics of the processes that slow down? Like if how, how the Go processes yeah, look? The one. <laughs> Kevin, are you um, are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you, yeah, you want to? Sorry, your question was um, you want to see like what other what what else slows down? Yeah, what process? Uh, you've other other about Go processes have like a, um, a huge load or the garbage collection explodes or a lot of Go routines. Like where where the slowdown might come from? Where were they slowed down too? I, like this is so the um, this is uh, basically all I, all I have here is just the the API call latency. So everything was affected. In the cluster, because this is this is the cube API. Everything was affected. I mean, it, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but like, what, like you're you're looking for like, I, like I don't have the metrics for every other load. Like this was the only thing that changed in this cluster was launching a lot of VMs at, really quickly. Yeah, I, I thought if, if some of our cube control plane processes might have also high uh, CPU memory or go routine loads that could identify what's coming from. Oh. Yeah, I don't have that. Okay. Do we know what list calls are coming from? So in that metric that you're looking at, there should be a way to uh, say what pod it's coming from, the request are coming from. So we, maybe we could do a filter over vert controller or vert handler pods. Do we see what list, do we know what API is being called from our controllers to cause this? Yeah. Um... I, somebody's got to mute. This is nuts. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, sorry, I thought I muted. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. sorry. <laughs> That's hard, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, do we have the metric? So maybe we can we can just see uh, which metric actually you are, you know, checking. And also which labels, you know, then we can check the label the metrics has. So maybe we can figure out some more information. Yeah, hold on. Um, it's going to take me a little bit to get to some of this. So the, um, the, so let me go to so the first one. We, you wanted to see like some of the events so we can see like, like well, I can get the, from the API server, like I can look at some of the, like the list calls. Is that what you're looking for? I want to know what list calls are coming from vert handler, if that's possible. Okay. Yeah, let me, um, there you go. Okay, you should be able to see, do you see my terminal? Yes. Okay, hold on. Let me...
Okay, so here you can see this was, this is from the API server. Here's an example of one. So this is five seconds. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is fixed already. Okay, but, so it does okay. look like it's listing all virtual machines there. Yeah, that was the issue which we fixed. I just can't find due to the noise in my background. <laughs> right, <laughs> VR. Okay. We, we can uh, maybe follow up on this. Yeah, uh, sure. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah, that yeah, I figured I'd mention it because I, I thought it was interesting in case it was something that wasn't known. So that's, okay, good to know. It could or could out. not be. Yeah, we'll find out. Uh, yeah, that's okay. certainly a good finding. Um, I, I think that would be interesting thing to present as well sometime in the future. Yeah. If it was. Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, if it was that bug, um, do you think it's just that your build was was not having it, or did we not backport it, and should we? Oh, you think it doesn't have this? Is that um, with the list call you're saying? Yeah, I, I did we backport the, the bug fix to do the others know, or might your three five builds, three four builds just not have it yet because it was a while ago? Uh, it I was not back for it as far as I know. Basically, we just did a build of it ourselves. So what should this look like if this is not um, what it should be? This should just be, this should have a namespace. Is that is that what's missing here? Or is this like, it should have an, a selector of some sort? Selector. This list or what? So, so does the list have, have the selector in the actual URL or is the selector something that's like a header or, uh, I don't know. At least if it's the bug, I think, then it should not do the call at all. Well, we're going to get a list of uh, virtual machine instances due to the former on all the virtual doors. So you'll still see. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, you're right. We but should yeah, see there, a lot of it. There is for sure. Right. A, 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 there is we're for seeing sure multiple there. lists. Like, this is all within a second. Yeah, that's the question. Like, if we have an informer, why is it constant? Like, it should just be, it should list and then, you know, compare what the results were and then attach to the, you know, the watch channel. And there's then, but an it's error. just, that it's just listing. Yeah, it's just constantly listing. Uh, yeah, if, if there's the an error. has an issue, yeah. you, should see, you should see it in the logs from the handlers. That it handlers. Is an issue. Yeah. So if the informers have an issue and are constantly re-listing and watching, uh, you should see it in the logs. OK, we can look at a handler. Is that, I don't know what this is. I think from our estimates, we'd see like, um, we'd see a decent amount from Handler just because there's so many nodes that, and so many VMs, it, it's like all together, it just kind of combines into this like symphony of just like a deluge of requests. So is this, I don't know, I don't know what resyncing for Handler is, if that's something that's an error or something, or something that should be, like what, what should I be seeing like if, given what you're saying. If everything should work correctly, you should see sometimes a list when for whatever reason the handler loses the connection. Yeah. But uh, so that uh, so it would then retry to try uh, until it finally reaches the node, uh, the API server, then it says, okay, I have to do a list again because I don't know the actual state, but that should be it. Yeah. And from that you should not see any lists, definitely not periodic or anything. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I guess like so we don't we don't need to like spend ton of time debugging. Like, I, if you think if, if we have like some issue about it, we can we can talk about it on offline on Slack and see if we can find it. But yeah, I agree. I like with that conclusion. Like, it, we seeing the number of lists is sort of surprising. We should 
there shouldn't be that many anyway okay but i'll leave that in here because uh, we can sort of follow up on this circle back and see what um what exactly we're missing with this or what's going on okay so um let's move on to the to some of the other work that's going on um we have a few things so we have the when we start with this one the so measuring performance this one's um Oh, actually, uh, this one. So do the work that you're doing, David, um, in this PR. So Dave's working on uh, VMI phase transition times. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Or I don't know, like, uh, I don't know how much you want to highlight from here, if you want to have some discussion. Um, uh, sure, I'll just, I'll highlight my goal with this real quick. Uh, the goal is I wanted a way to, uh, when we're doing these stress tests, to be able to, uh, monitor um sorry i'm a little bit distracted my daughter wants my attention i think one second give me like five seconds sure. i wanted a way to monitor uh the total um time until running when we're doing these stress tests uh so the way I was looking at it was I just wanted to track the time between creation and running and then be able to look at the outliers. So I wanted to see the P95 uh, for when we're um, P95 outliers for the time between creation and running. When I do a stress test, I see that P95 go up. Similar to if you were doing a stress test on HTTP server, you would see the request latency go up. So we can see that uh, it's taking longer and longer for VMs, identical VMs to go from the creation state to the, the running state. So I can do that with the gauge. Uh, and that was the, the original idea I had. Uh, through the discussion, we began talking about some more advanced ways of getting something similar that might give us a finer granularity of detail of the interface transition. So between like, for example, scheduling to scheduled, that's not reflected in my creation time to running. But with a histogram, we can track uh, the transition time between every single phase as well, which gives us a finer, more fine granularity view of exactly, at least between what phases we're spending the most time. Um, with that histogram, I found that it was really difficult to get to my ultimate goal of just the P95 of creation to running. You can get something pretty similar, kind of, it's just a lot of calculations and it's presented a little bit differently. And I was never really quite satisfied with the histogram for my, for my goal, uh, but I see the, the usefulness of the histogram. So I think what makes sense and what I've landed on uh, is uh, the histogram and the gauge would make sense. So we would get both metrics. What I'm curious and what I think the discussion that would help me right now is understanding how people would use the histogram because I'm still not seeing completely the value. I think I might be seeing the value, but like what, how would people use this histogram and what would it give them that's interesting? Because it's not obvious to me. Right, so one of my comments here about the histogram is, you know, uh, the gouge, you, you take like the, only the least uh, uh, metric that it's reported. So for example, consider that you have like a 30 seconds is a uh, scrap, you know, scrap interval or even longer, depends on the cluster. Maybe you don't want to have Prometheus scrapping all the time, you know, everything. One minute, for example. And then you have one minute and when you scrape, you just get the, the, the you know, the least, the least metric you don't get all the uh, VM transitions or VM creation that happened in between. So histograms actually shows uh, everything, you know? You get like uh, all the VM transitions phase in the histogram and not just the least uh, uh, metric, you know, uh, value that it's there. So Makes that's, sense. yeah, that's why I, I mentioned that. So uh, what we would miss here, so in my, my gauge, we wouldn't be able to, um, so I have a label for every phase. What you're saying is the granularity of the time interval for scraping perhaps would miss some of those. And that makes total sense. We, yes. we probably always mm -hmm. hit running because running, 
assuming a VM stays up longer than the scrape interval, we'll, we'll, we'll eventually hit it. Um, mm -hmm. So for the running condition, it probably gives me what I'm looking for. The individual phases uh, time, less accurate because we'll miss it. That makes sense to me. Okay. So really my metric is only valuable, I would say, for running. Yeah, yeah, what both, about both um, nice, yeah. what about like uh, hysterium is like one way to represent the data, right? Like in the gauge sort of it is another way, right? Like can't we can't you still like so this kind of what, what this is representative representation of a gauge, right? Can you have multiple lines on this? Sure. So representing each phase. You would can. that I mean the problem is that we'd miss it. Uh, that's what um, he was just pointing out uh, because of the scrape interval. Like we'll, we'll get running because running is going to last longer than our scrape interval. But yeah, isn't I mean, that, so you're, you're can we change you the time? Create a gauge for, since you create an extra gauge for every VM with extra labels, I think you would see all of them for as long as you don't delete them. But uh, yeah. Hold on, I wanted to see one of them because I, I mentioned this. Even, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. You, you could use it. I think you can use this. You can use a gauge vector where you just like apply a bunch of labels, like essentially like what I was saying, like to create multiple lines. The only thing you just apply is like um, the phase in the name. And we just, we just, um, we just get, we use these to differentiate. So we have a line for like a phase or something. Um, maybe we don't need name. We just have for everything. And then we have a phase to differentiate and we just record and then eventually we record in the same gauge, but then Prometheus just scrapes it all and gets um, a few different um, metrics from, from a single gauge. Oh, like that. I see. So we would have one gauge reporting values for uh, every transition constantly. That, that's, that's possible, yeah. Then we would never miss it, right? Yeah, like, cause then, cause then isn't like, cause then histogram is just one data format and this is like another data format Then we can choose, I mean, we have both. Like we could, we could technically report both if we want to, I guess, um, depending on how we, we want to look at it. But I, I think we can get the data either way. I mean, like, like I said here, like you can use a histogram back is what it's called. And then a gauge back, either one, however we want to report it. But I think we can, either way we can get the data for the individual phases. The histogram works with buckets. That's the thing that uh, kind of threw me a little bit. So we're only getting the level of detail down to what bucket the metric falls within. So you're not getting exactly how many seconds, you're getting how many seconds it is and what bucket that landed in. You're getting a count. So let's say, um, let's say it took 30 seconds to transition between scheduled to running. Um, mm -hmm you're not necessarily getting the value 30 seconds recorded, you're getting what bucket that fell into in the histogram, which maybe let's say that was the... So actually histogram also has the count and sum, and then you can get the average and you will give like the exactly what gouge average is doing for you. Yeah. Because in, it too, yeah. yeah. You yeah, get the average, but you couldn't get like the P ninety five. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, the way well, that you can, going. The, the yeah. gauge does the same. The sum gauge is this is is pretty much exactly the same like the gauge which you have, David. So you can do the quantile there too, but yeah. How? Yeah, but the quantile with gauge, it's this for the sample that you have in Prometheus, and the quantile in the histogram it will be like uh, you know with all we don't miss any you know the, the, i think the yeah. point that we are saying is if, if we yeah. miss something so histogram will not miss that and so the, the, the gosh is all the, sorry Marcelo, go on. yeah so and uh, i don't I, i'm not sure if I, I understand what's the problem with the the histogram for the data representation that you, you guys mentioned before how do I get the P95 from creation to running with the histogram? If somebody could give me, I, that I want this graph. If I can get this graph with the histogram, I would be happy. And I can't figure out how to do that. It's with yeah, the histogram. If the metric that I just comment, the last, the last one, you should get 
something very similar to that. Because you apply, you know, a rate in the histogram and you take the also the, the P95 you know, as a point and then you plot it. The so, problem I have with, uh, so, sorry. <laughs> you don't need to have a heat map with histogram. You can just, you know, take the quantile of the histogram and plot it as a point. I'm, I'm getting the create, I'm not getting from creation to running. I'm getting a, uh, between different phases. Like it's a different metric though. So, I mean, you could create a histogram also from creation to running. But yeah, if we talk about having just the phase itself, then you would get uh, the quantile for each phase, which I personally think is very appropriate for scaling, for scale testing. So that's always the point I don't get. I mean, with the gauge from the histogram, we, if it's really just for the scheduled and scheduling phase, it's really just for the phase that we just have a few and the data that you get is exactly what I would consider to be the thing we want to see. But Obviously not for the for you. Well, I'm just thinking about like what's the thing that we're tracking in real life. Like if somebody posts their VM, what they're impacted by is the time of when they post it to the time that it becomes available. So I just want to track exactly that. I, I don't want to interpolate or have some sort of interpretation of what that might be. I just want to actually track that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you might, can, yeah. Yeah, in no, no, case, yeah I would say that it's true. So you should have a maybe a histogram for just the whole thing, you know, from create you know submission to running. And and uh, we don't have the the phase between, yeah. That would make right. sense to me. That would be more accurate. That would be closer to what I'm looking at in a histogram form. Uh -huh. but for performance testing, it's definitely per phase a histogram is definitely what I would want to because there I can really see easily with heat maps and so on where things go when the scale goes up. The problem I had with Prometheus histogram so far that nobody could probably explain to me yet is um, the, the bucket sizes are, are, are predefined. You can't, like, they can't change. So we have to define bucket sizes that make sense. And that's always the hardest part for me so far. I don't know if that's a problem here. I personally don't see it as a problem because there are interesting, I mean, you have to do some upfront checks and see what you want to see, what you would define as interesting, but you do that once and you can then say, okay, in this time range, it's interesting for me and everything above is just too slow. Yeah, okay. And so, so for instance, you wouldn't care if uh, if the starting on thousand VMs, there is there are some VMs where it then takes for some two hundred seconds to start. It doesn't really matter if if it's two hundred or one hundred when you say it should be below fifty. Mm. So you have your upper bucket of fifty, and then then you have the bucket for everything above. So we're talking like so we're talking. I'm gonna just show the two side by side. Where's the here it is. Okay, so here's one. One data format. So we have like here we can see like over time, we can see that there was an increase in uh, it, in time it took to go to running, and then with like the histogram here we can see that um, over time we have a lot of really slow ones that are taking this. I I think they're both valuable. I think they're both yeah, valuable. Yeah, right. Like, All I want to repeat again is if 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 you create a histogram too in addition to the histograms per face where you go from creation to running, uh, you, the histogram is also collecting the sum and the count. So you get exactly the same thing too <laughs> with it. Okay, yeah. so what you're saying is that we can generate both these graphs. Yeah. So yes. the heat map, is a yeah, the his heat map in, in Grafana is a special interpretation of the histogram, which you okay. get from Prometheus, but the histogram has also the count and the sum as a gauge exposed, or as a okay. content the gauge. Yeah. So then I guess the question is to you, David, like, does that, do you have enough? Like, it sounds to me like histogram would work, but it is, do you have enough information? Does that make sense to you? I don't know yet. I, I need to okay. play around with it. It's kind of frustrating to me uh, just because I, 
Like I know exactly what I want <laughs> as far as what I want to see the performance increase of. And I know how to represent that. Um, and I'm, I feel like I'm going through a lot of hoops to get what I want just in a different way. And I don't understand entirely why it's useful. Like I understand why it presents the information in a different way with the histogram and how you can get some, uh, uh, some interesting, more detailed results, especially with like the per phase transitions and things like that. But when it comes to the, ultimately the metric that I'm interested in, I'm going through all these hoops just to yeah, get the so, exact same thing. Um, I would say one per phase and from creation to running, that would be good for both. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, okay. immediately after you have done what you have done, you would you immediately want to have the details from the histograms then, as I see it. Yeah, I see the histogram is definitely being useful. I, I, yeah. I want to make sure I'm, I'm not like shooting it down. Uh, I, I think that it's like the next step is, or maybe it's the first step for some people, but when I'm running this, I want to see, okay, latency increased and the histogram is going to directly correlate to what phase we spent the most time in. Uh, and that's all great, but I like both views. Yeah, just make a histogram for this too, then you can, then we're good. All right, yeah. so if, if help me understand have, why like, histogram helps for the uh, the view that I currently have. Is it performance-wise or like uh, from a metrics collecting perspective or, it, or what? Yeah, it, it has the advantage that uh, it's, it's collecting all the data client-side already and you can't miss anything. It's just collecting more data, right, than the gauge? Than the... Uh, yeah. That's all it is. It's gauge override. So if some, some new metrics appear and then you miss it. So Instagram keeps, you know, tracking of things because it's counting many, many different uh, points. So with doing it client side, what happens if vert controller crashes and we get a new vert controller? Are, are we losing uh, the histogram? Well, it, it, it would reset and Prometheus would uh, realize that it did a reset. Okay, I'll mess around with it a little bit more and uh, see if I can get similar results that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my suggestion is to have two histograms. One is for creation, another one for the phase. Okay, I'll, I'll see how this works out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's go to another. Uh, so this is um, uh, on the mailing list. Uh, Fan proposed this. Um, how to improve improve performance in the vert controller. Um, this link to the thread, and he put together um, a pull request. Um, with a little bit of an example of what he's looking to do. I, I don't know, Fan, if you're here, um, but I think um, it would be good to kind of talk about some of the ideas. Maybe we can find, kind of learn some things from this um, ways like we can find this because um, Fan saw some improved performance from this. I don't know, Fan, are you here? Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, Fan. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, why don't you walk through a little bit of what you did and I'll leave this. Yeah, time. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, so basically it has uh, three topics. So one, one thing is we, uh, I wanted to reduce the encode uh, happens in the bird controllers. Uh, the oh, third oh, one, uh, the, well, yeah. One second, one second. So the, to, to preface this a little bit more that, so this isn't, so the bird controller, um, we have our, um, oh, I don't have the, I wish I had the picture that, um, but okay, so in the bird controller, we have a, we have a reconcile loop. Um, we're going through, we're doing an update and that's and that's where this update status and there's this informer and then, and that's kind of the background in this. I'll find the, I'll find the picture and I'll put it in the background while you, while you talk then, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. So can, can you go to the issues? Yeah. Uh, the, the issue link. Uh, this one right we'll talk. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so, so basically this is what we observed in the in practice. So the latency between the pod creation and the, the 
VMI equation. So uh, when I look into the uh, into the uh, uh, print out the logs for the pods and the uh, uh, VMI status updates in the virtual controller, so we can see a lot of inqs uh, happens in the virtual controller, even though these inqs are not relating to the status updates. So uh, when I reduce the, the inq times by inq only the uh, status uh, inqs the ev events. Uh, relating to the status changes. So the, the Q lens reduced, uh, uh, reduced very much. Uh, so that's the, the first part of this uh, proposal. So we uh, I wanted to reduce the in Q happens. So only reduce something like a create part, a create part or delete uh, or update the VMI status happens or something like that. And the, the second thing is I, uh, so as right now, uh, yeah, I agree that the uh, using the queue, worker queue model is good for the concurrency process, but I think we should have some uh, supplement uh, for pre-processing, like to uh, rolling the ball fast uh, before in queue uh, into the worker queue. So that, that's the proposal, that's the, the third part of this proposal. Oh, the second part of the proposal. So we, when we create a pod, uh, the create pod can uh, can trigger uh, trigger the creation. Of, uh, yeah, when we uh, when we uh, have a add VM event happens, the, uh, this will uh, this will trigger a create pod event. So uh, before enqueuing that, so we can use it uh, when the uh, when some some failure happens, we also we can still enqueue uh, this event to the worker queue anyway. Uh, so this is a basic idea of the rolling ball. We we still keep the a major logic of the worker queue, but we just a uh, faster speed the processing. Uh, yeah, so that that's a, a basic logic. If I can ask a question, um, what I don't understand here is. The work is still being done. So we, we have the logic is still pro being processed in the exact same process. Um, we're just moving it around. So to me, that's it's curious that we see a performance improvement by moving logic from one place to another place when it still has to be performed within the same process. So if the worker queue can't keep up for whatever reason, then we're shortcutting some logic to be executed early. If that improves the situation, I feel like that's an indication, at least from my standpoint, that somehow our worker queue is is wrong, or we, we're doing something horribly inefficient to, to not be able to have the same performance as you know putting some stuff in the actual callback handler. Do we know what like what's going on with our worker queue? Do we have any indication for why it's not able to keep up and this actually improves performance? What you've done? Um, yeah, the, the, the basic, um, the issues is the worker queue has very long uh, queue length. So as I look into the queue length, we can see uh, hundreds of events. So if we don't change the, if we don't change the thread using the default uh, uh, 10 threads, for example, uh, we uh, in the practice we all, always have hundreds of uh, VMIs, uh, hundreds of keys in the queue lens. So keeping hundreds of keys in the queue lens, or for creating of 500 VMs. So these queue, these keys in the queue lens uh, uh, come come from uh, key, uh, keys from the pause events and the yeah. VMI events. So they mix it together. So if I, as I illustrate in the issue, so uh, when we, the, the time is when we created a, a VMI and uh, uh, associated the events like uh, updated the pods, updated the VMIs, uh, queued up in the uh, distribute, they are not sequential, it's a distribute in the keys. So next round of waiting for available worker to pick up the, uh, this key would, would, be, would wait uh, for a while. So that's the latency happens. I, so but I see that I see that the queue backs up. So and yeah, you're right that that's caused by uh, we're enqueuing from lots of different places. So we're looking at the pods and the, the virtual machine instances and stuff, and lots of places can pop some or 
play something on the queue. I'm more interested in um, why the queue, worker queue, isn't able to keep up with that. So the fact that we're seeing it backed up, uh, I'd like to understand why our worker queue is inefficient. Even when we expand, it sounded like we gave it lots more threads. Um, what's going on in our worker queue that means it's backed up? Because I would think, for example, if uh, we have, let's say, 100 VMIs queued, uh, keys queued, that we should be able to chew through that in like milliseconds. It should be nothing, uh, especially when no API calls are, are being uh, invoked. Yeah, and especially considering that, for instance, when we look at the uh, NQs coming from pods, well, we have to think that at the same time where we seem to collect all the backlog in the queue, the Kubernetes was able to process the VM, update it, and even send the watch update to us and NQ it, and we are behind. So this is really weird. Well, we could be doing something silly, like uh, making an API call every time a reconcile is popped. And yeah, if we just remove or... that, then we, uh, it sounds like we're just doing something bad in our work yeah. queue. And that uh, the, what you've, uh, the evidence you've given us is that by removing logic from uh, the work queue, uh, execution somewhere else improves things. That means that the work queue probably is doing something inefficient. Like, I mean, I, th I think that's really valuable. I, I question um, more so um, where we're targeting our efforts on imp uh, improving the performance. I would want to understand more details about the actual work queue execution and where it's slow and perhaps even get some PPROF on, on that during a stress test um, instead of moving logic out of it. Because I understand that improves things, but I don't know why. Right, I, I see like uh, hiding the problem, you know, like uh, you are bypassing something and then you just, you know, don't see the problem anymore. Um, I, I, and also I think like bypassing, you know, the work queue, it's like, uh, you know, removing the whole, you know, uh, you know, fundamental, you know, idea of Kubernetes that it, you must have things asynchronous and send it to the queue and process everything asynchronous. Um, I think it's going to a different direction what Kubernetes suggests to do. So would you say... Um, my yeah. Resp yeah, go on, yeah. Ryan. Would you say this? So um, uh, we'll kind of break down some of these. So like number three, if we go from say like pending, um, like we say we shouldn't skip phases. Is that is that what we're saying or? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So uh, you can skip phases. That is not the issue. I, that's not the issue. The, the thing is that even having this one phase more or less should not by far have this impact which you're seeing. There is something yeah. wrong in our code, which okay. Uh, that's what, what what we try to say. Okay, that makes uh, sense to me. So so then like uh, sorry, Fay, <laughs> you keep trying. To, go ahead. I'll go off you. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, so, sorry. So in the update status, so number three, I'm talking about the number three. So in the update status, so currently, uh, for example, if the BMI is uh, when it's created, so it's automatically going to the onset. So it's waiting for the next uh, available worker to pick up that one and uh, check the VMI status and moving forward to the next status. So um, uh, considering in the case, um, the the pod is being running very quickly, and uh, um, and uh, but now there isn't a worker. If there isn't an available worker to pick up the update the VMI, so it's uh, still in the up, uh, onset. And for the next uh, available worker pickup, so in a current logic, it's a, it it only checks if the pod exists, not ready. So it uh, will go into the scheduling, not the schedule B. So it, and it also needs to wait for uh, the third uh, the third uh, available worker to pick up to process it to, to schedule D. So the latency happens is the T1 and the T2. So the, 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 the latency is a very controller. So you're saying one worker needs to pick this arrow, each of these arrows, one worker, one worker needs each time we need to do this. And each yes. of these take a noticeable amount of time. And I guess what, yes. what everyone's saying, right, is that is that this should be not a noticeable amount of time, right? This yeah. should be happening instantly. I mean, it we need to identify what's when... blocking the work queue. So, yeah. you know, and not bypass the work queue. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, you okay. should, of course, see, I mean, we have a limited amount of workers and it has to go some places. So we, of course, increase the API load when we have more phases and everything. But as you see, the API server as such seems to be perfectly happy. It, it can start the pods fast and the API server reports the updates to all watches fast. So uh, we should, well, you should see a delay when you start more VMs. And if you start a lot of them at the same time, you should see also maybe quite some delay for a very short amount of time, but not over such a long period. This is mm -hmm. really, this really looks very weird from a logical point of view in our control. Okay. So I guess like the next steps, like I, if we can, what we can do here. So like, I think we're, we're kind of circling over the problem. So we need to figure out what is, so what's going on with the work queue? What is it with the work queue that could possibly not be causing um, or what's causing it to be slow. Like, I think maybe one thing would be useful if we could see a diagram of like the keys and how it balloons and see like, okay, like over time, you know, how quickly they're, they're being processed, you know, how many they're getting to relative to the of VMIs. I think that help. Um, maybe a picture of that. And then, and then maybe we can start looking at some, some of the code snippets. Like, how does that sound uh, for a next step? Yeah, I'm not sure. There should be some metrics for controllers already. I'm not sure if we expose all the controllers metrics which are built in by default. You should see some, but at least uh, you would need some measure points regarding to the sync logic, the update status logic. And yeah. you would probably also want to watch the REST API calls with puts if they take long or not, stuff like this and often that. Yeah, I think this was a the uh, one of the... Um... One of our goals. We wanted a oh, we wanted right. key size, right? I think so. Work yeah. key length. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there should be a metric which collects how collect how, which collects how long the the queue yeah. itself takes or the the, the 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 processing of the queue entry takes in our logic. If because we have this controller framework. If not, it should be pretty trivial to add one or two measurement points in the controller itself. And then you can probably see at least immediately if uh, uh, in which parts of the controller roughly the the time is spent. Yeah. Because okay. that well, is I think right now really where we are blind. So we see they're they're piling up in the queue, in the queue length, which really means that our individual processing of the entry seems to be slow. And yeah, maybe one of the keys, you know, to the problem, you know, to check which one it's taking like too long to, you know, in the thread. Yeah. So I guess like, well, Fan, I don't know, you can tell me what you think. Like, so we can do, so I, I think there's like, we have three, we have three metrics around work queue anyway. Um, we can look at doing something like that, kind of looking at implementing some of these metrics and trying to get some of this information, or we can, we want to look at, uh, do the faster way and kind of just, generate it again and look and generate a graph from whatever data you can gather, um, whatever you think. But we do want to definitely get to these eventually, get some of these work queue links. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay. uh, I really think there can be, uh, go on, go on. Uh, yeah, I have some, uh, I have some tests on my local uh, machine. Uh, I just uh, print out some logs for each uh, 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 in, in print, just directly print out the log in the code so I can uh, I can see the log file of the controller to see how the work on, uh, how the queue works how the event caller works. Uh, for example, in my uh, I can see that uh, there are uh, for each uh, VMI updates the virtual controller call is uh, thirty. Uh, uh, there are thirty events. Uh, uh, 30 uh, actions on the VMI updates and 70% uh, 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 of them are about the in-queue uh, uh, in uh, in uh, activities. So um, when uh, they're, they're normally- Could you they're elaborate a little bit on that? Sorry for interrupting, but could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by there are 30 updates due to the requeue? What does that mean? Oh yeah, so uh, means uh, so uh, every time it's the uh, every time the uh, event handler is called, they will in queue. Uh, it will in queue in the worker queue, right? That's what we call it's a, it's an activity of the in queue. So the in queue happens 
uh, 30 times. Yeah, so, so, but that should not necessarily be a problem. The, 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 the part which we have to do, right, is that we don't do any rest calls when not necessary. So, uh, and uh, to not hot loop on status updates, like changing timestamps or whatever there. Did you see something there, like that we're really doing status updates of the VMI, which should not happen? Uh, I, I think, yeah, that's my point. So if we, uh, for currently, the, we, we, do, we do nothing except the in queue in the worker queue and waiting for the uh, main logic to process. So if I reduce the in queue times, so uh, just to in queue something relating to the status happens. So we, we can still update the VMI status, but the queue length reduced very much. So we don't need to, we don't need to in queue so many keys in the work queue for the, the same VMI. Uh, so, uh, and also uh, I, I see that in the current stages, uh, when we in queue so many, when we start in the creating the VMI for 500 VMIs, the queue length grows very fast. And uh, we have to wait for a while, like the three minutes for the, for the VMI to be picked up and uh, update, uh, starting the update. The yeah, stages. so that's that's so that's one of the problems. Like we, we the queue queue length, how slow they are, and then and, and then the other thing you mentioned, like, and maybe this is like, so do we need to requeue every time a pod is updated? Like for example, what you're doing here, like, like what, like, do, is this would this is this something that we want to run through all the? Yes, yes, we do yeah, every do. single time, so, even like on a a scheduling for a pod. Yeah, I mean, you would have to embed here then the logic when something is interesting or not. And uh, which means that you have to keep it in sync here. Like if you're in the main processing logic are then looking for scheduling uh, conditions and want to update then on the VM status, you would have to keep it here in sync to to really enqueue it because it's interesting. And you actually do not, and you would also have to look on the VMI if the VMI has the data already or not. So it's really hard to tell here. And mm. this should really not be the thing right now, which we should look at. Uh, th there are other things with the callbacks, uh, which I'm happy to explain in detail if interested regarding to go routine scheduling, where we have issues if we do too much in the callbacks due to the lock mechanism. But um, the, the key thing for me is I do not, un it, I can understand if things become slightly slower if we really start a lot of VMs. But what we, what I did not see so far is an indicator on how long we spend on processing the VMI, for instance, even if we don't have to do anything, because it should just not matter too much if we enqueue it 10 times or 20 times when it doesn't have to do anything on the objects. That's most, that's, there are pretty much all in memory actions. We do a few memory lookups, we, we do a, a few comparisons of objects and we decide, okay, we don't have to do anything. And that should be really fast. Just again, think about the fact that the kubelet and the API server are doing in the same time all the work with the same model and giving us all the updates on those objects. And they really did something there, including REST API updates. And we are supposed to do, do pretty much nothing on many of them. But they have the same model. They have the worker queue. They have the, the, the execute functions. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So one we question. Very, it's either there is a, an issue with popping out the queues or our controller loop is extremely slow and we have a probably stupid or silly mistake in there, which yes. slows it down. Did you check the CPU utilization of the nodes that it's running the controller? Maybe you are getting saturated, you know, I don't know just guessing, you know, 100% of the CPU. And then, because if you are processing many things, for example, when you bypass things, you re decrease the CPU utilization and then you see things going fast. So, but if you have to keep processing, you know, small things, but you need to keep processing, just to double check if it's not the CPU, the problem. Yeah. Angel, this is actually a very good hint because I think we are not setting CPU limits, uh, CPU requests uh, in this old release by default. And uh, you may end up in the, uh, in the best effort quality of service class. And 
if which uh, and which this means that you may share the CPU with a lot of other processes. And what Kubernetes does here is it gives the process just a very small amount of CPU time very often if nothing else is there. So you get minimum amount of time, then the process gets stopped. Kubelet checks if it can run it again, it lets it run it, or, or not the Kubelet, the C groups, but the Kubelet configures it that way. And that's why we would do, for instance, on VMIs, we do by default always a minimum CPU request, I think at least 10 M or so, just to be in the other class where we get much more CPU time. So this could really be an issue that it doesn't get CPU time. Right, it, it might be that it's not keep up, you know, processing things. So I'm not sure, so just guessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, okay, I'm writing a few things down. So like, um, let's diagram the queue length, let's measure the cost of each in queue, let's do pre-prof of the per controller, and then um, let's look at, um, what was it? You wanted to need like the CPU. Um, CPU request. Um, okay. CPU request, you should set one. Um, you can do that pretty easily by specifying on the Qbert namespace some defaults, you know, some request defaults. Okay. Then you get them immediately there. Just set them to something reasonably high to just rule it out, that's it. Okay. All right, so we have some options. Um, okay. I think that'll be like the next steps for, for this one. Um, okay, and we can kind of circle back on that. So there's a mailing list thread we can, maybe we, we, during the week we can use the mailing list thread to see what we find and then we can, um, in, in two weeks time, we can talk about like some of the, the findings for this one. Okay, cool. All right, I, we're at time. So if the uh, last few seconds here, does, are there any other open items? Um, anything else anyone else wants to bring up? Yeah, let's see what's in here. All righty, that's it then. Thank you, everybody. Oh, and make sure you add yourself as an attendee. And I don't know if it doesn't look like, I hear more voices than there are listed here. So, all right, thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.